Jay Callahan, we're going to be talking about humeral shaft fractures next, moving down the arm. Uh, we'll cover the incidence, some anatomy, uh, quickly go over classification, treatment options, uh, and obviously talk about what needs surgery and what, what doesn't. So in terms of the incidence, these, you know, 3 to 5% of all fractures, uh, like many orthopedic injuries, is a bimodal age distribution, the younger patients and high energy uh, injuries, and then you have the elderly osteoporotic uh, patients. <clears throat> In terms of the anatomy, uh, it is a cylindrical bone. Uh, as you move distal, it becomes triangular, uh, thins out on the lateral uh, view. The intramedullary canal terminates above the olecranon uh, with the fossa. Uh, serves as a major insertion for uh, multiple muscles, the pec major, deltoid, coracobrachialis, and then the brachialis, triceps, and brachioradialis originate uh, distally. Uh, several nerves that you have to worry about when dealing with the anatomy of the humerus, the one that we always kind of worry about the most, spe uh, especially when considering surgery, is the radial nerve. Uh, this courses in the spiral groove posteriorly. Uh, a couple landmarks, uh, 10 to 14 centimeters proximal to the lateral epicondyle at exits, and then uh, 18 to 20 uh, proximal to the medial epicondyle on the medial aspect of the bone. Uh, anatomic studies have shown that it pierces the intermuscular septum on average, 10 centimeters from the distal articular surface of the humerus, but never closer than 7.5 centimeters. Uh, commonly used classification, uh, OTA, so you have the simple uh, wedge and complex fractures. Uh, more common, you know, often when describing these, we talk more about kind of descriptive approach. Is it proximal, middle, or distal third? And then the fracture pattern itself, spiral, transverse, or comminuted. <clears throat> the Holstein-Lewis fracture is a uh, well-known uh, eponym for this fracture. It's a spiral fracture, distal third. Uh, the reason kind of we worry about it is there is a higher incidence of radial nerve uh, neopraxia with this particular injury. Uh, initially, it was thought that this was a, you know, needed surgery. Uh, it's since been shown by multiple authors that you don't need to operate on these. Uh, in terms of initial uh, Investigative studies, you want to do an AP and lateral radiograph. Uh, you can consider transthoracic lateral uh, for better appreciation of the sagittal deformity so that the x-ray techs are not rotating the arm. Uh, Non-operative treatment begins with the co splint. Uh, this is majority of humeral shaft fractures. Uh, the criteria for acceptable alignment is uh, 20 degrees anterior angulation uh, or posterior, 30 degrees varus valgus, and less than 3 centimeters of shortening. Uh, these criteria were created in uh, 1966, and you know, in the last 50 plus years, we haven't really uh, had any data to change these numbers. So that just shows, you know, some degree of malalignment is acceptable, and patients do functionally fine. Uh, we haven't really gone any further than that 50 years. Uh, in terms of the application of the splint itself, uh, you want to create a valgus mold to counteract the deformity, uh, mold it high up into the axilla. You want to avoid bun bunching of the plaster, and then obviously mold over into the neck. This, this is a lot easier if the patient is seated upright or standing. Um, that way, if, if you kind of do it when they're lying flat, then it's really hard to get it up high enough. It just kind of starts rolling down the arm. <clears throat> so some of my older patients or obese patients, I don't even really honestly bother with this. I'll just do like a posterior splint and a, uh, a sling because they don't tolerate this very well. So that's something to consider. Uh, then, you know, one to two weeks once the swelling goes down, you convert them to a functional brace in the office, start early elbow range of motion. Uh, this is, on average, 10 to 12 weeks you, you wear the brace. Uh, the problems with this, uh, you have to frequent x-rays. Uh, skin breakdown occurs, and depending on the study, anywhere from 2 to 10 percent of cases. Uh, patients can't weight bear, and if it doesn't heal, then the surgery uh, doesn't do as well as if you had done it initially. So Sarmiento is kind of the big name with non-op treatment of humerus fractures. Uh, he, this is a clinic study he did. He had over 900 patients. 620 were followed past fracture union, so a big cohort was lost to follow up. But his numbers, he found less than 2% non-union, uh, and greater than 80% of these had very acceptable deformity. Uh, note he did not study the pain or functional outcomes in these patients. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
Uh, Ekholm, uh, this is a JOT article, he looked at 78 patients treated with bracing. He actually looked at the functional outcomes, did a radiographic assessment. He, he had a very high union rate, 90%. Uh, he found that the uh, transverse fracture, simple fracture patterns had a slightly higher uh, non-union rate at 20%. Uh, and once again, the non-unions uh, that required vision surgery had worse functional outcomes, which is, makes sense. Uh, kind of similar to the proximal humerus uh, studies, uh, a lot of these patients did not have a full recovery. So, This was the first uh, prospective randomized controlled study comparing operative versus non-operative treatment of humeral shaft fractures. It was actually dated per percutaneous meeple plating uh, through an anterior approach. Uh, this was JBJS. Uh, they found that all their surgical cases healed uh, versus 15% non-union in the bracing group. Obviously, the surgery had less malunion. Um, they found that at six months, the surgical patients were better functionally, but there was no difference uh, past six months, and there was no difference in short form or pain scores. <clears throat> this is one of the larger studies uh, looking at bracing versus operative treatment. Uh, it was retrospective. Uh, they, they found that the non-op group had a higher non-union rate and uh, interesting incidence of radial nerve palsy as opposed to the surgical group, uh, which throughout studies, surger, surgery on uh, humeral shaft fractures generally is around 3% radial nerve palsy. Uh, more recent studies suggest that that number should actually be lower using uh, modern techniques. Uh, they found no difference in union or range of motion. So obviously, these can be treated surgically or uh, conservatively. The, the main issue, if you treat it non-op, then the patient's going to have a worse functional outcome. So the real problem is figuring out which patients would benefit from surgery and try to avoid those kind of delayed surgeries. Uh, some predictors of failure seen in the literature are transverse fractures, distraction at the fracture site, segmental fractures, these Holstein-Lewis distal fractures with displacement, and then patients with obese uh, body habitus that are not really amenable to bracing. <clears throat> Surgical indications uh, from the start include failure of close management, uh, poor alignment and tolerance to bracing, uh, open fractures, floating elbows, uh, which is basically you have also a both bone forearm fracture below a humeral shaft, uh, brachial plexus palsies. The reason for this is uh, if you, you know, non-operative management, you have to brace it and you can't, you can't start really moving the arm uh, as effectively and it inhibits the recovery of the brachial plexus. Uh, pathologic fractures as well as segmental fractures. <clears throat> So once you've decided to do surgery, you have a few options. One is to, you know, or if a plate and screws or an intramedullary nail. Uh, also, obviously, there's, there's external fixation, which is, you know, more in a polytraumatized patient. Uh, it's pretty rare that you treat these definitively with an X-fix at this point. So the benefits of plating, uh, obviously very low non-unit rates. You get rigid fixation, immediate uh, motion. Uh, you're avoiding complications at the shoulder and elbow. Uh, downsides, longer incision, more blood loss, longer at operative time. Uh, I am nail, smaller incisions, as you can see here. Uh, it's percutaneous. Uh, it can immediately weight bear, as with plating. Uh, downside is, you know, anti-grade technique. There's concern that you're going to cause damage to the shoulder, particularly the rotator cuff. And then similarly with the retrograde technique that you're going to cause elbow problem. Uh, this was a prospective study at a JBGS British. They, it was a pretty small sample size. They had 24 plate, 20, 21 nails. Uh, they found no difference in function or return to activity. However, there was higher incidence of shoulder impingement, uh, complications, and secondary procedures in the nail. This is kind of one of the first studies that really compared the two and one of the most frequently cited. Uh, since this study actually came out, there's, there's been a decline in the use of intramedullary nails. Uh, for humeral shaft fractures with an increase in plating. Uh, they concluded that ORF was the best, you know, treatment for unstable fractures of the humeral shaft. Uh, Cochrane did a review in 2011. Uh, they found similar, no difference in union or radial nerve palsy. However, uh, the intermedial nail had a higher incidence of shoulder impingement, hardware removal, which makes sense. Uh, so if you in terms of plating, a couple options. Proximal two-third fractures, uh, anterior approach. Uh, this is an extension of the delto pec. Uh, you basically, the patient is supine. You retract the biceps immediately and you uh, brachialis splitting approach. Uh, 
Uh, posterior approach is distal two-third fractures. The patient can be lateral or supine for this particular surgery. Uh, and this, this, you have to worry about the radial nerve dissection. This is just a uh, gross uh, example of the interlateral approach. Uh, it takes advantage of the dual innervation of the brachialis uh, between the radial nerve laterally and muscutaneous nerve medially. Posterior approach, um, two, two options, tricep split versus paratricipital. This, this image is showing the tricep split, uh, which provides access to the distal three quarters of the humeral diaphysis. Uh, you're, you're separating the lateral and long heads and then intramuscular division of the uh, medial head. Uh, obviously the radial nerve crossing the field limits your proximal dissection with this particular approach. The lateral par paratricipital, uh, you're going between the lateral head and lateral intramuscular septum. Uh, the cutaneous nerves are an anatomic landmark, bringing you to, uh, to the main uh, radial nerve. Gerwin uh, did an anatomic study. He looked at, you can actually expose over half the distal humerus without mobilization of the radial nerve through this approach. However, if you want to go you know, proximal to the mid shaft, then you have to dissect out the nerve, take down the medial triceps from the intramuscular septum off the posterior humerus and reflect it medially, and that actually gives you access to 94%. At this point, you're basically limited by the axillary nerve proximally. Uh, typically, uh, the dogma has been large, large frag plates for humeral shaft fractures. Uh, some of the, you know, some of the new implants, I know striker, distal humerus, extra articular plate you can use for humeral shaft fractures, not, not technically large fragment plate, but it does work for a majority of patients. Um, Usually you don't have to do locking screws. Uh, if it's a distal third fracture, then you know you use them distally, especially if you need a couple of unicortical screws. Uh, you can consider it in really poor bone. Potential benefits of the nail, it's less invasive, uh, invasive load sharing. Obviously, once again, the negatives are the shoulder issues. Uh, currently, most people use them for complex polytraumas, elderly osteoporotic patients. I personally don't do IM nails in you know, younger patients that are high functioning, if, I, if it's something that I can plate. Uh, if it's you know, a really segmental fracture that extends you know, all the way from uh, you know, the surgical neck down to this, the humerus, then the, you know, it's something that you would nail. Uh, technical tips for, for nailing, uh, you, know, you want to countersink, obviously you want to avoid uh, impingement at the shoulder. Uh, you want to protect and repair the rotator cuff so you, you want to make sure you're retracting while you're, re, you're reaming and you do a re, good rotator cuff repair. Uh, I use fiber wire for that. Uh, you want to minimize risk at the renal nerve. So, you, you know, you, usually you can push, especially if it's a simple fracture, you can kind of just push the, the reamer past the fracture site and then ream again once you're into the canal distally. Uh, you, obviously, you don't want to lock the nail with a uh, fracture gap. <clears throat> So complications with treating these, uh, this non-union, so it's similar between nailing and plating. This is a recent article in JOT. They, they found that um, if you're gonna treat these conservatively at six weeks, if you, they recommended doing a clinical evaluation of fracture site mobility. They found that if it's still mobile, then uh, it's 99% specific for uh, going on to a non-union. Uh, so, that's something just to kind of think about at the office visit at six weeks. Uh, malunion, obviously increased risk with conservative measures. Radial nerve palsy, uh, these are seen in, you know, depending on the cohort, eight to 15% of closed fractures. Distal third, particularly that Holstein-Lewis fracture we looked at before as a higher incidence. Most, most improve, so, you know, nine out of 10 of these are gonna resolve. Uh, most, on average, their spontaneous recovery at seven weeks with full recovery at six months. So, since most of them, you know, improve, the initial treatment is observation. Uh, you want to consider EMG. Uh, it used to be at six weeks. Now, you know, the recommendation is you can even wait up to three months uh, for some recovery before getting the EMG. Uh, the first thing you're going to see is wrist extension radial deviation with recovery of the brachioradialis. Uh, Reasons to explore would include open fracture with radial nerve palsy. Uh, these are more likely to have transection of the radial nerve as opposed to uh, neuropraxia. And then closed fractures that failed to improve uh, at six, over three to six months. Uh, Boastman, uh, 
did a study where he looked back at 59 patients that had immediate palsy upon presentation. Uh, similar numbers, 88% recovered. Uh, he found that 16 patients had a, a secondary radial nerve palsy after reduction of the fracture and splinting. 14% uh, of these recovered. So, uh, you know, extrapolating this data, the recommendation has always been if someone has radial nerve function, you reduce them, splint them, and then they lose radial nerve function, you can still observe and expect, you know, 9 out of 10 to recover. Thank you.